Thanks for joining us for another episode of Life Sciences CEOs. Our guest today is Gaurav. It's a tough one, 12 letters. Ali. Okay. <laughs> yes. Gaurav is the CEO of PZO Therapeutics, a company uh, developing a platform for vaccine delivery. Um, we've been trying to do more to learn about life sciences here in Atlanta. And Gaurav is an al alum at uh, Georgia Tech and has a real commitment to helping build the ecosystem here. He uh, uh, has also had a stint at uh, uh, investment banking at MOLIS and uh, has worked as well at the uh, i -Corps, as an i -Corps fellow at the uh, National Science Federation. Um, so kind of a diverse background. Gaurav, you spent some of your youth though, I think, doing kind of uh, a reverse commute back to India. Um, and, and I wonder if that had some impact on, on um, your, your early stage development in terms of uh, sciences and uh, uh, maybe wanting to be a founder. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, I mean, so I've spent most of my life in Georgia. I was born and raised here, uh, but I did actually move to India for a few years at uh, the direction of my parents. And not I wasn't happy at it at the time, but you know, it happened to work out for the best. And after moving back, I think really what the experience in India taught me amongst a bunch of things was really the difference in healthcare systems between what it's like here in the United States and in India. I think we like to deride the system that we have here, but I think if once reality hits and you actually see what other countries deal with, you'll learn to appreciate that we actually have structure here and we have processes in place. Uh, whereas in India, it's very decentralized. And I think there's an even more gap in terms of income uh, and access to healthcare. I think really it's if you have sufficient income and sufficient financial support, you get good access to healthcare and what the government provides is insufficient. And so that was my motivation to really get into the industry, but I didn't know exactly how. Uh, I think I, originally I followed this cliche pathway of I'll be a doctor. I, I broke my hand when I was a kid. My pediatric doctor was truly incredible. And I thought, man, I want to be just like this guy. This is what I want to do. And so that's where I originally began. But early on, I actually got introduced to the field of synthetic biology. And so this was about eight years ago. And synthetic biology now has grown immense. We've had the IPO of two companies in the space, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks and Zymergen. Uh, but at the time, I think it, it was growing quite a bit and not exactly where it is today. Um, so I originally got my start working on diagnostics. And during that time, the epidemic was breaking out uh, in Yemen with cholera. And so our focus was building biosensors to help detect some of the cholera in wastewater. So that was my early introduction. I began working in the space there in genetic engineering, really on the cutting edge of biotech. And then I happened to cross over at the University of Georgia, as much as a GT alum, I, I hate to admit, but I, I did spend some time there. And that was my introduction into the world of vaccines. Uh, and so this was around 2017, 2018. We were working on viral vaccines for HIV. And my lesson from that was if it really takes six to eight weeks just to come up with a vaccine candidate, we're screwed in the, in the midst of a pandemic. And obviously with COVID-19 now, we saw just that. And at the time, I'd heard of this company that wasn't as big as it is today uh, called Moderna. And they had gotten a grant from the Gates Foundation and then raised a bunch of money working in this field of mRNA. Uh, and at the time, we were looking at both mRNA and DNA vaccines, which there is one approved now in India. So I came back to Georgia Tech, and I began to work in the space of frugal science, essentially building ultra-low-cost versions of commercial devices. And we wanted to apply that same methodology to improve the delivery of DNA and mRNA vaccines. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Our research basically accelerated, and we were able to publish a paper demonstrating a novel delivery platform that we developed for DNA vaccines. And now fast forward a few years later uh, with a couple million in the bank and additional proof of concept, we're now trying to translate the same platform for both the DNA and mRNA vaccines. And I think it's really come full circle for me because I originally began working in global health. And now that's also a focus of our company is trying to help bridge the gap we saw during COVID of millions who didn't get access to the vaccines, um, mRNA in particular. And so we want to improve the safety the affordability, the accessibility, and scalability of these medicines, and hopefully we can do just that. Let's talk for a minute about that fertile science, because it seems um, so distant from what we typically think of as the scientific method. Um, 
how did you how did you get involved? What made you think that you could take um, you know simple products and turn them into something more valuable? And what's the thought process um, that enables you to to go through that journey? Do you have to think differently than you would normally in the scientific method? What's the thought process? Yeah, for sure. So I would say it still very much follows the scientific method. So I I co-authored a a review paper on frugal science, and we basically explained exactly how it works, which is you take the, the fundamental principles of a process you want to look at. So in our case, for example, it's electroporation which means you're using brief electric pulses to help get some material into a cell. We focus on DNA and RNA, but you can do other things. So fundamentally, what exactly is that? It's a short, high voltage pulse. And so then you can look broadly and see, well, what are some other systems that are out there that fall under the constraints that we want to operate under, which are cost, access to power, scalability, et cetera, uh, and essentially find a complementary system that can work. And so we found out that barbecue lighters actually fall under similar constraints. They're produced in the millions. They don't require any access to power. And they actually produce short, high voltage pulses. And we figured out that if you actually tune the mechanisms that are inside these lighters, you can get them to produce the exact pulses that you need to electroporate anything from bacteria to human cells, which is what we're doing in our case to deliver vaccines. Uh, but the process really does require you to think differently. It's uh, it's honestly unorthodoxy at its finest. You just basically need to take the box that you often operate under and smash that box. You need to look outside. You need to, in some cases, just look at things that are around you every day, like a ballpoint pen, maybe a cup of coffee as I'm sat at this coffee shop and think, well, what could I do with this? What could this be used for? And it works in two different ways. It could be that you have a device that you're trying to find an alternative for, and you basically look at the fundamental principles and see what else is out there that could replicate that. Or you go the other way around. You find an object that you see around you every day and you think, well, what else could I use this for? And so we basically took this technology that's been around for decades and a scientific principle that's been around, I believe, for 150 years, discovered by Pierre Curie, and found out that besides just you know lighting a barbecue in, in the fine summer of the United States, you could actually use that to deliver medicines to people. That's it's just incredible to me um, that you could. It is. I'm reading this uh, Isaacson uh, biography of Einstein, and I'm not much of the way through it. Maybe twenty percent or something. But what I'm learning is that the the thing that strikes me about Einstein was that he was able to take uh, disparate fields of science, physics, chemistry, and put them all together. He he was able to see a vast array of of uh, permutations, things that can happen out of different things, and that seems to be what would be required in order to do frugal science. Because when I look at a barbecue lighter, it's just a barbecue lighter to me. That's all it's ever mm-hmm. going to be to me. Um, but the, the the creativity that that underlies that way of thinking is just, um, it's extraordinary. It's just really neat. Yeah. And I mean, I have to give huge credit to my mentor here who, He's my, my advisor at Georgia Tech who really introduced me to this field. So his name is Saad Pamla. And he originally came from Stanford, Stanford where he developed a 23 cent centrifuge, uh, which is inspired by a toy that's been around for a very long time called a whirly gig. Uh, more popularly, I think we know it as a button on a string. And he was able to discover that if you can apply that exact system to spin down blood samples and even diagnose malaria in the field. So he was on the bleeding edge of this field early on, and I was fortunate to have had the introduction to him. And now we've been working together for many, many years and are hopefully trying to expand the field and also expand access uh, to, pe- to people to enter into it. I mean, the original inspiration for this field was really to help bridge the gap and get people access to equipment that they could not otherwise get access to. Uh, originally, when I was working in synthetic biology, I was in a very underfunded lab. I mean, we could not afford an electroporator. They cost five to $10,000. Some of the ones that are used in humans can approach $50,000. It's just unaffordable for a lab. So how can you come up with something that is low cost, accessible, and that's something that people can actually use for themselves? So that was the original inspiration. And now we've tacked on a few other things. Uh, we also collaborated with Mark Krauss at Georgia Tech, who's a pioneer in the microneedle space. And that's what's got us to where we're at today. It's almost serendipitous 
really. It just kind of happens, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's like, it's, I, I, I will say like when you're building a company, a lot of pieces have to fall into place. Uh, and I think a lot of timelines definitely have to work out. So if you do go through a pathway, it's never truly linear as my my career as shows. But in the end, you you get to a destination that's incredibly valuable and fulfilling. And that's that's where we're at today. So you take two long validated uh, uh, technologies, um, electric impulses and, and micro needles, and you combine them to form your platform. Tell us about the platform and how it works. Yeah, for sure. So in order for a DNA or even an mRNA vaccine to work, it actually has to get into your cells. And so with the mRNA vaccines we've seen, it's actually a two component system. There's the mRNA that encodes the antigen. So for the COVID-19 vaccine, that's the spike protein, uh, but it also has a shell around it. And that shell is called a lipid nanoparticle. And so you need this lipid nanoparticle to drive the mRNA into the cells. And while it's excellent at doing that, it comes with another set of challenges around cost, around manufacturing, thermostability, and even reactogenous. And so our approach is to take a technology that's been around for 40 years called electrophoration, which is the use of brief electric pulses that basically do the same thing. They create pores in the cell membrane, and that allows your payload to enter. And by doing this, whether that's LNPs or electrophoration, you're able to get hundredfold, thousandfold higher responses uh, with your vaccine or whatever payload you're actually delivering. And so what our platform, the innovation that we're building on in this field is that instead of using traditional uh, capacitance discharge machines, essentially complicated circuits, we found out that you can use the simple mechanism that's analogous to what's in a lighter to produce the same impulses. And then you can actually use microneedles, which function as electrodes to conduct those pulses into your skin. So by doing so, you get highly targeted and localized delivery into your skin of a DNA or mRNA vaccine or other therapeutics if you want to deliver those. Uh, and in doing so, we're able to substantially improve immune responses, cut the reactogenicity that you see with some of the other vaccines, and accelerates the development timelines and simplify the manufacture. Um, so there's a lot of upstream and downstream advantages to using this approach uh, compared to what is now considered state-of-the-art, which is lipid nanoparticles. Um, tell us about... Um... Let's let's explore in more detail for a second some of the disadvantages of the lipid nanoparticle delivery system um, because there are many, right? Um, and uh, it's a problem. I mean, the the big problem in biology today is not identifying the target, not even necessarily. Um, uh, identifying a, uh, a way to attack that target, it's the delivery. That's where all the yeah. problems lie. The delivery it, manufacturing of that delivery system. That's the big bottleneck right now. And you seem to be solving it. Tell us about, tell us about lipid nanoparticles. Tell the, the viewers why they're, they're great, but they're difficult. Yeah, and, and you're exactly right. Like people often try to disassociate drugs and drug delivery, but the reality is that there are two things that go hand in hand. You need drug and delivery for anything to actually work out. Um, lipid nanoparticles have, have a rich history, and obviously with the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, we've seen the efficacy that they're able to deliver. So clearly they meet on the efficacy front, but they come with the other like a, a substantial host of challenges. Um, the first is on the manufacturing and development side. Uh, LNPs often require screening for you to go and go after different targets. Um, it's not always the case that you can use the same formulation for two different uh, systems. So it's not always plug and play. So you may have to go through some initial screening time to actually find the exact delivery system you want for the payload you're going after. The second is on the manufacturing side. Uh, mRNA, we're actually able to manufacture in a pretty straightforward manner. And I think that's been aided by the history we've had in producing DNA. Uh, but producing lipid nanoparticles has been incredibly challenging. There's a whole host of complex machinery. Um, there was even an article published on either Pfizer or Moderna's system and CapEx that they made into developing the infrastructure to produce these. And it's a complex multi-step process to actually synthesize them. And then even after you've synthesized them, there's a whole host of tests that you have to do to meet the FDA criteria in terms of purity, encapsulation, et cetera. 
And then you get to the thermostability challenges of having to store these vaccines at, at minus 80 degrees. So those are some of the upstream challenges we see. And then downstream with the delivery of these vaccines, I think you see some concerns around reactogenicity. Uh, I think while the, the profile of the safety was good, uh, I think you're seeing bigger side effects in a substantial portion of the population. Now, while they're not life-threatening, they're still concerning. And I think in the U.S., we already have a problem with vaccine hesitancy and acceptance. And I think now if you add another host of tolerability concerns, the uptake of these shots may not be as high. And I think while we've seen that during COVID, even now you're seeing that people may not be getting the boosters. Getting flu shots is already a barrier. Now, if you tell people that they have to take the day off work, uh, they may experience better fevers or chills. Are they really going to go in to get the shot, right? Unless it's some condition where there's no other option. So those are some of the other challenges we see. And then I think finally, the biggest one is cost. The cost of producing, producing these vaccines is substantial. And I think we see that the cogs of using lipid nanoparticles as a delivery mechanism contributes to sometimes 40 or 50 percent of the overall cost of producing wow. these vaccines. So it can be substantial. Uh, and the supply chains for these were highly constrained during COVID. And I think even going so in the future, the expertise uh, for developing these is really limited to just a few companies. And so our mission obviously extends to global health and not just the United States and Europe. And so we want to make sure that other people in the world get access. And if only a few sites can actually produce these, that's not really amenable uh, to getting vaccines out there. Uh, and then finally, I think actually a new challenge that's emerging that's a bit unique in the space is on the intellectual property side. Uh, lipid nanoparticles, uh, people are making minor tweaks and patenting a new formulation. And then they're starting to sue each other, saying that you're infringing on that patent. So I think right now we're already seeing this between Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, Arbutus, Acutus. There's just a whole host of patent infringement suits. And I think where this also plays a big role is for smaller companies that are trying to get into the space, they don't have the capital and they don't have the teams to fight some of these lawsuits. A simple threat of patent infringement could demolish a small company if it comes from a big pharma company. And so we're seeing a lot of these challenges that people are emphasizing. And I think now with how long the vaccines have been around, we're really trying, really understanding what these challenges are and what some potential ways to address them are. And so our hope is that by cutting out lipid nanoparticles from the formulation of mRNA vaccines, we can actually substantially improve the delivery and address this range of challenges. So you start out with this process through frug frugal science and, and develop um, the beginnings of a product. What do you do in terms of customer discovery as you begin to put uh, sort of the, the walls around a company? Right, exactly. And that this is the big thing. I think for scientists, it's very easy to talk about our technology. We can go on and on saying, oh, this is the cool thing we've developed. But at the end of the day, if people aren't willing to pay for what exactly you've developed, and if they're not, it's not actually addressing a problem that's out there in the market, it's not going to really have any value. So after we, had, while we were developing the technology, uh, we actually went through the, the i program hosted by the National Science Foundation, where you have to interview a bunch of executive scientists and a diverse range of, uh, of other people uh, to really understand, well, is there actually a problem in the market that you're addressing? If so, what are the value propositions of your technology versus somebody else's? And what are really the hurdles to adoption? And what do you have to do to get customers, keep customers, and attract new ones? And, and so we did a bunch of these interviews, and this was during 2021. So it was an exciting time because the first vaccines were coming out. Uh, and we were understanding right then what the challenges companies were facing on the mRNA front were and on the DNA front, which is also a focus for us. Uh, and so we did a substantial amount of that work. And the interesting part of it is that a lot of the interviews we got were through cold emails. Uh, I think this is something that people often underestimate the power of. Um, I got my job in investment banking through a cold email. Um, so I had learned from that what it's like to you know break into the industry. And the same thought was, well, I know a few, quite a few people in pharma, but there are places where I don't know people. So how do I reach out to them? The obvious way is going to a conference, and I've met a pl a plenty of people by attending conferences, but cold email is also a very powerful way to reach out to people. And so it, even though it's a numbers game, I reached out to a bunch of people to really just chat with them and learn more about what they're working, what are some of the problems that they're facing, and what they think could address them. Uh, and in doing so, and after speaking to a bunch of people, that's basically help frame the thesis that we have for the company and also validate our hypothesis that there truly is a problem on the delivery front for DNA and mRNA. And we believe that we could actually address this. And so 
where are you now in terms of developing an actual product? One that, that uses similar methods, but but not directly, um, you know, a, a barbecue lighter, so that you can you can get scale and and you can get uh, uh, you know similar results one to another. Yeah, for sure. So we've done proof of concept studies in animals. So that's really the founding work for the company. Um, since we set up late last year and closed our fundraising round early this year, we've been doing additional proof of concept work. Now our model essentially relies on partnerships. So we don't develop the actual drug or vaccine. We work with the companies that are actually producing them and leverage really a, a tested and true model in drug delivery, which is partnering with companies that are developing the actual drug and work with them through clinical trials into a product. So that's the model we're using right now. And we're fortunate that we're already working with a few companies in these early stages. Um, so we expect that over the next few years that we will have the product cleared by the FDA and enter into some clinical trials. Uh, of course, there's always a long road with clinical trials and it's not always predictable. Uh, the reality is, is that it's always a long shot in producing a drug. Um, but our hope is that our delivery platform can really add value to the to the companies that we're working with and the companies we will be working with. Uh, and so that's the overall goal. And we expect in over the next few years, we'll be in some of these early clinical trials, phase one and phase two. And, and over time, we'll we'll be able to reach approval. How will that process or do you, do you imagine that process will work? In other words, um, will you do separate trials for each vaccine? Or can you do a singular trial with one vaccine and have it apply to many? Well, the latter would be the dream. Yeah. And I don't think the FDA and, and the, the European uh, government have, are really on that front yet. Although I was at a conference recently and it looks like there's discussions on that front. Uh, because if you're using the same platform with minimal changes and you're just making minor tweaks and sequences, well, the hope is that you shouldn't have to do a massive clinical trial to get approval for a new target or a new payload. Um, so that is that would be the dream. Uh, but I think from just regulatory constraints right now, that's not how it'll work. So we would go through clinical trials with every partner on different payloads um, as a standard with any other drug delivery device, uh, even with the syringe needle you still have to use the same syringe needles uh, when you go through the clinical trial. Same thing with the pre-filled syringe and same thing with other similar technologies that are out there. So we would go through clinical trials for each of these targets uh, and then hopefully the majority of them will work out and then a product will be on the market. And so how will that work? Will you license the platform to the drug company making the vaccine in exchange for a royalty and have them do the, the, the trial and pay for the trial? Or is that something you'll participate in directly? How, how do you see that working? Yeah, so I would say the former is the more popular model. Um, and that's something we're definitely adopting, I think, especially for working with companies that have sufficient funding and want to take the lead in the development of the programs, which often is the case with big pharma companies, then that's, that's usually what we do. But the cool thing and interesting thing about us is we are working with companies across all stages. So from small startups um, with some money, but not a lot, to larger pharmaceutical companies. And so in those cases, the model will adapt based on the cash flow and, and the investments that these companies have. So while a large company may be amenable to a licensing-based model, maybe with smaller companies, it has to be different or tweaked and we basically will work with them to see what exactly is feasible. Um, but I would definitely say that a licensing-based model is the most popular approach. And from our customer discovery research and the many pharma companies that we've spoken to, that is the approach that they always take with, especially in the drug delivery space. Okay. And and you touched upon this uh, earlier, and I've been involved with a company called Halazyme that has an enhanced um, uh, product that is a, a subdermal uh, delivery okay. system uh, rather than an IV. And the attraction to the uh, to the bigger company um, is that they boost the patent life. You know, it kind of starts. Would that be true? Um, in your case, do you know? Um, and what would that process look like if you had to sort of apply for it? Yeah, so this this is certainly an interesting question. And I think this, this especially piqued my interest seeing how insulin has been developed over the past few decades. I mean, we see that insulin right. is basically concentrated 
within a few companies and they have figured out that they can extend their their IP for a very long duration of minimal changes. And so there's certainly interest in the drug delivery space. And I think Halazine is the one that's pioneering that. I think it would apply to a narrower set of drugs. Um, I don't think it's always straightforward. And I think when you also look at that, there's the other question of clinical trials. Uh, so there's a huge question on the regulatory front of will the FDA simply accept that, let's say, you use a new delivery method for an existing drug? Uh, will that just be accepted? And will it, will the FDA say you don't have to do additional clinical trials? We believe the barrier threshold's already been met and you can just use the new technology. Or will they ask for another pilot study to confirm that there's no difference in the safety and efficacy of a new delivery method versus the prior? Um, so that, I think, is the bigger question that comes. I think the IP side, in some cases, may be more straightforward, but I think the regulatory side can be unclear. But I think if you're able to match both of those and you see that, yes, you can extend the patent and yes, there's a straightforward regulatory pathway, then I think the value becomes enormous. Uh, and especially I think this decade, we're seeing some blockbuster drugs uh, experience patent expiration. I think I think Keytruda is expiring later this decade, but I could be wrong. It is. Uh, I don't know. It, it is. is. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that Halazine is working on, um, you know, an alternative delivery method for it. And I'm hopeful that it would extend the patent. Although um, I'm also aware that there was a case in um, in Great Britain, um, which kind of shot that down, at least, mm. you know, at least there. So we'll have to see what happens with it. But uh, uh, I'm hopeful that it might be the case for you. Um, yeah, and and I and I think the other approach that some companies have been taking, and obviously the, the producer of Keytruda is as well, is looking at combination therapies, and essentially combining it with other drugs and pipelines that other companies are developing. And there, the IP becomes very clear because it's novel since it's in the combination. Right. Uh, and so that's the other brilliant strategy. And obviously, I think the efficacy results we're seeing from the combination of Keytruda with other drugs is is pretty immense. Uh, so I think that's become a very obvious pathway for them. Right. And of course, you know, Moderna is working uh, uh, with Merck on, on yeah. Truda and supplementing uh, the ef efficacy there. So um, that could be a really good thing. So I understand that you are um, perhaps looking to uh, to extend uh, the, the ElectroPen past uh, vaccines to to. Uh, other therapeutic proteins and, and gene therapies as well. Tell us about that. Are, have you made progress there or is that sort of the next step dream? What, where do you stand in? Yeah, so those, those that's certainly in our pipeline and we've spoken to a few companies that are very interested in that space. I think electroporation has historically focused exclusively on vaccines. I think that's been the most popular approach. And certainly for us, I think the, the synergies are very obvious in the vaccine space. And that's why we focus especially on DNA and mRNA vaccines. Uh, but we are looking at it from a more long-term standpoint of, can we deliver therapeutic proteins, immunotherapies, even dermal gene therapies? Um, those are certainly within the focus. And I think the, the data that we gather from these early stage pipelines that we have right now will really inform our ability to tackle some of those other ones. And I think the value there is also very clear because therapeutic proteins is becoming a very popular target for companies in the nucleic acid space. I mean, a lot of people are suffer from conditions where they have to take daily injections, which in some cases there may be long acting ones, which are a week long or bi-weekly that are approved, but in, in a lot of cases they're daily injections. And, and what if we could replace that with a single payload that maybe lasts for a couple months? Uh, maybe in the case of gene therapies, we've extended it to maybe permanent changes so that right. you could never have to take another shot again. But then again, the cost of those therapies and the regulatory barriers are a whole other story. Um, so it seems like the midway approach to that in the meantime is actually, well, could you have increased the duration out of expression of these payloads like human growth hormone or testosterone, for example, for a period of time? Um, with the ultimate goal being, well, could you then develop a gene therapy that could actually just alter um, the makeup of a person so that that's now produced. That's now produced, and obviously, we've had many gene therapy approvals in the past few years. Many in the cell therapy space as well. So it's rapidly growing, and I think it's very exciting to see the progress that's made there. Uh, and our hope is we can hopefully tackle that. Um, but we definitely feel that the the space that we're especially excited about is in vaccines, given that our pitch with our technology is that it's ultra low cost, under a dollar is the target. Uh, 
it's portable and it's rapidly scalable, which especially is suitable for vaccines. But we do believe we can expand further into the therapeutic space. But the, the difficult thing in genetic therapies is durability. And, and you know, there's the, the, the risk that you might have to do it again, and you can't. Mm-hmm. And, and I would think that, that your method would overcome that impediment. You'd be able yeah. to, uh, to, to administer as many times as you needed to. Correct. So this is, this is a huge challenge in viral vectors. So I was working on viral vectors many years ago, and repeat dosing is, is a huge concern. Uh, So that's why there's a huge push in the space to move from viral to non-viral delivery mechanisms. And I think this is where lipid nanoparticles are are making a lot of headway. Uh, And our technology could, and I think uh, it it would be especially concentrated in the dermatology space. So there are a lot of conditions um, where gene therapies could be beneficial in dermatology. And I think our device is particularly suited to work in that space, given its localized delivery to the skin. Um, But there are other applications and variations of the technology that we could make to adapt it to other things. But your point is, is well taken. Viral delivery is a huge concern. Even viral vectored vaccines have been a concern. I think that's why you have to either space out the shots by a huge margin, uh, or you you basically can't do repeat dosing. It has to be a single shot, which may have questions on the efficacy side. Um, but but that is definitely a huge concern with viral vectors. And I think we're seeing a push towards non-viral delivery as a result. Okay. okay. So 2022 was uh, not an easy break easy year to uh, to raise funding. Um, you were able to raise $2 million from, from open plant philanthropy. Um, what was that process like? Yeah, it was it was a very brutal year to be fundraising for everybody. I think what we noticed in, in 2022 is that we're seeing a lot of cuts in biotech pipelines. Um, and be, given how the market state was, a lot of VC firms wanted to restrict the cash that they had and particularly fund later stage assets. So it became less focused on seed series A and more into the growth space of companies that already have established pipelines. Maybe they needed to go from phase two to phase three or go from phase three to filing for approval. And so that's where we saw the pivot. And even though we saw some massive rounds, that's really where they were concentrated. So for companies that are in earlier stages, still developing proof of concept for their technology and there's still hurdles to overcome, it it wasn't as easy. And I spoke to quite a few investors, um, I mean, over 50 to 60 at a variety of different firms that I know. Uh, and this was just a common theme, uh, but we were very fortunate to find open philanthropy and their their mission very much aligns with ours and that we really want to improve global health, improve the accessibility of medicines. And so they were, we had very productive discussions with them and, and they were willing to invest in us and we're incredibly grateful. But I think ultimately like investing in a down year has its up benefits and its disadvantages. I think obviously raising larger rounds becomes much more difficult. In our case, that wasn't necessary, but for other companies that are in the space, that was a huge challenge. Uh, companies were raising money at lower valuations than their previous round, which was particularly hurt for both prior investors and the, the founding team. Um, and obviously for early stage companies, it was a challenge. But I think for us, it, it taught us a lot. Um, it also showed us how to really be proactive in predicting what cash flows you need, when you need to fundraise, and raising exactly how much you need. Uh, because for companies that are raising $50 million at $100 million valuations, you've already diluted yourself half. So it's not very valuable to future investors as you keep going forward. Um, so a lot of lessons learned, but we were, we were incredibly grateful to Open Flow and 3 They're an incredible partner. Uh, I'm very thankful for them for investing in us. And there's a bunch of synergies that we're excited about as we go forward. Did, did your time at Molus? help you in that journey and um did yeah you, did i think go i think it did you, it did did you go I, yeah i think it did because you thought that you might need that experience in the future or was it really a career pathway it was really a career pathway i i i was working in the biotech group at the bank and basically i want to work where biotech meets business and at the time we had not closed our fundraising round so that's why realistically i thought that that would have been a viable pathway, but it did teach me an immense amount. I think being in investment banking in 2022 is was is, was one of the most valuable things anybody could have learned. I think you learned the special situations that companies had to go through to save cash and just keep employees and keep running. Uh, we learned about companies looking at alternative pathways to going public. I mean, SPACs were common in the past. 
There are companies that uh, basically have no pipelines left that are already listed and they're essentially looking for someone else to take over. I think there are just random situations that popped up in 2022. And so being at the forefront of that and seeing those play out was definitely incredibly helpful. And obviously being at a, at a firm that specializes in M&A and restructuring, um, we know how the process works and I, I've learned how the process works. And so as we go forward, at some point, there's always an exit strategy and a horizon that you have to look at. And so by being in, in that space, it's, it's really taught me how do you really look at that? Who do you need to speak to? How early do you need to build some of these relationships so that you're not basically waiting until the end moment to try to make a deal if you need to make a deal? So it was incredibly valuable. Uh, and 2022 is just a, a weird year for biotech. And but it was an exciting year to, to be in banking, I suppose. I can tell you, as I look at all the red on my screen, 2023 isn't much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it isn't. And I actually think for in terms of fundraising, it's going to be just as challenging, if not more. Uh, I think we are seeing massive rounds this year. And also biotech M&A is picking up. I mean, Pfizer bought CGen for some 40 or 43 odd billion. Uh, Novartis has made acquisitions. J&J is still looking at, at M&A. Merck uh, also acquired a company. So it, it's becoming very, very active. Uh, but still, I think the VC fundraising is especially pivoting to later, later stage companies or very established teams. I think when, when you have a team that's basically tapped from a big pharma company and you take their leadership that's leading the company, then those companies are going to raise massive rounds. But uh, I've, I mean, I've listened to other podcasts as well from VC investors on really what is the benefit of raising these rounds? Like we see a hundred, hundred fifty million dollar seed Series A. Like what does that even mean? Like a company that has very little IP that probably is still in in vitro studies, having a hundred fifty million, and you're giving them five years of cash runway um, without really knowing how it'll play out. Um, and also, I think in these hundred fifty million dollar rounds, it's it's not one person writing a hundred million check always. It's probably portioned like many different ways. And so you have a bunch of investors now that you answer to, a bunch of people that that you have to speak to and keep updated. And I think it makes things very much challenging. And so it's I think this has been like a test to see whether we could pivot from this milestone-based fundraising model to just immense cash at day one and try to stretch it out as far as possible. And I think we're learning that a milestone-based approach it makes a bunch of sense, and it's it's raise as much as you need and to stretch out for as long as you need. Yeah, yeah. So we we talked a little bit about how Molus the Molus experience has helped you. What's it been like to transition from the academic world to the commercial world for you? Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Uh, I think. I, I've been fortunate that I've, I've worked at a few companies, and so I've seen the business side of that. I worked at Anthem, which is now Elevance Health. So I was formerly at a health insurance company. I was at Capital One, which is a consumer bank working on product there. So I saw that. So I've been fortunate to see the business side. But the big pivot in, from academia to, to the, the industry is, is really how you approach collaborations and how you approach some of these discussions. I think a lot of people in academia, our core focus is publishing. It's published papers, published papers, published papers. And while we still have a commitment to publish as much as we can and, and really share the data that we're developing, uh, there's a huge impetus in the industry to all, not always do so. And it's wait as long as you can to publish so that you have certain inflection points. Maybe you get more money. Maybe you launch a deal off of it, et cetera. So it's interesting to see that dynamic play out. Uh, and then also the people you speak to. I think in in academia, you're very used to speaking to scientists. You speak to the people who know the science. science you can talk to them for hours about the coolest thing that's happening in the mRNA therapeutics world or the DNA vaccines world. But when you pivot to industry, your discussions aren't always on the science. It could be, well, wh what does your cash flow look like? When is it stretching out? When do you need to raise your next round? What are your milestones? What are your regulatory discussions? There's a lot of moving pieces that you have to figure out. And the people you speak with could be scientists, uh, but they also could just be people on a business development team who've come from investment banking or consulting and are focused much more on what are the synergies that you could achieve from a partnership? What would be the transaction structure that you could achieve from that? So I've been very fortunate that since I've worked at a few companies, I've seen this side, I know how it works, and you can basically talk the lingo. Uh, but when you come straight out of academia, that that can be a challenge. And I, I'm just, I think I am very grateful that I've seen both worlds and I can talk both worlds. So if I'm speaking to a scientist, I know exactly what I'm talking about and we'll probably lose track of time and be three coffees in still chatting about what a lab just published on mRNA. Uh, or and at the same time, I could be talking to the CEO of a public company on why we think we should work together and what this could mean and how it could be accretive to your earnings, for example. Like it could pivot to literally anything. 
Yeah, yeah. Let's let's close by talking for a minute about a subject that we both care about. How do you see the future of Atlanta evolving as we try and grow the space here? Yeah, I am extremely excited at, for what's happening in Atlanta. And it's very interesting to see how it's progressed over the past few years. I mean, I could say two years ago, I could not really name other founders in the space. Even one year ago, I was basically going out of my way to reach out to other biotech founders in the state. But now I see them every month. And we all know each other. We're all part of the community. And I think it's been benefited by a few things. I think what's made Boston such a phenomenal ecosystem for biotech is a few things. Ignoring just the academic side of the universities that are there. You have talent, you have capital, you have infrastructure, all in very close proximity. And I think though that's the key equation to really developing a very innovative and very growth-minded startup ecosystem. Silicon Valley has done the same thing with tech. And for Atlanta, we haven't had that. I think lab space has been limited. The infrastructure has been incredibly great as you move out of academia. The capital was, was not substantial before, uh, but the talent is there. Uh, and the university, ta the university talent and the university resources are also there. I mean, Georgia Tech is here. Emory's here. CDC is here. Georgia State is just down the road. And the University of Georgia is also just further down the road. Like, they're all here. Uh, but now we basically have the key resources that we need. Science Square is coming up right off of Georgia Tech's campus. We're going to have a skyscraper with lab space for a bunch of companies. Um, there's also apartments that are going up. It's multi-use. That's just incredible. Uh, we also have Portal Innovations, which has set up shop in Atlanta. They are taking space in Science Square, and they're taking initiative and in, in leading on a lot of the events that are being hosted with the biotech community. And we also have the Nucleate program at Georgia Tech, which is now really bringing together academic founders and people from industry, people from BC, et cetera. So I think with all this happening, it has just transformed the biotech scene in Atlanta. And as an Atlanta native and a person who spent the vast majority of my life in the state and my family, who's also spent a good, the vast majority of their life in the state, I am incredibly motivated and excited uh, to see what Atlanta has to offer. And our hope is to keep the company here for as long as possible. Um, I think we want to contribute to the growth of Atlanta and we want to give back to the ecosystem in multiples of what it's given me. I've gone through school here. I've even went to university here and I've seen the value it provides. And my hope is as a company and as an individual, we can give back into the future. Yeah, I think it's uh, it would be uh, expecting too much uh, to think that we might turn into Boston. I'm hopeful that we might turn into San Diego. I think that's a good place to start. And I think- Yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, I would say, I think- I think it's we, we have to keep the dream alive. I think keeping the dream alive of becoming the next Boston would be phenomenal. And I actually think it is pretty possible. I mean, tech, I, uh, to give you the example of tech in Atlanta, tech in Atlanta has grown immensely. And as someone who used to work in tech, like seeing the ecosystem grow has, has just opened my eyes. I mean, a decade ago, the skyline was practically empty. There were a few companies that were here, but now we have Microsoft, we have Google, Airbnb is coming here, BlackRock is here, Capital One is also coming to Atlanta. So the tech scene has grown immense. Uh, we have Atlanta Tech Village that's incubating tech startups. And we also have several VC firms focused on tech investing already here. Uh, so I think the tech ecosystem has grown so much that companies have decided, well, this is an incredibly valuable space to set up shop. Right. And I think we're now seeing that with biotech. But I think your point's well taken on how long will it take. It's not going to be a 10 or 15 year transformation into Boston. It's going to be something that'll take decades to get there. Right. right. And, and we've had a great shot in the arm with a joint venture between um, Georgia Tech and, and, and Emory, which has now yes. uh, had national uh, you know, renown. So mm -hmm. done very well. So Rob, it's, it's just been a pleasure um, both to know you now locally and, and to have you on the podcast. Um, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And... Uh, I wish you all the best in your uh, in your uh, frugal science adventures, and uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to kind of following up with you on a future podcast as we uh, as we uh, continue to to watch your your success. Absolutely, thank you so much for the opportunity. Really enjoyed this conversation; it, it was awesome and. Uh, Looking forward to meeting you again in Atlanta. I'm sure I'll see you around at many of the events that are happening now. Great. Okay. Thanks for tuning in to the Life Sciences and Biotech Podcast. We'll see you in the next episode.
The information contained in this website and podcast are purely informational and not considered investment recommendations. Tim Doherty's participation in Biotech Insights is separate and apart from his role as an investment advisor representative. Nothing contained herein can be construed as a recommendation or endorsement of any of the companies discussed. Tim Doherty also has no financial affiliation with any of the companies mentioned in this communication. Tim Doherty makes no representation that the information contained in this material is accurate and is under no obligation to update this information as changes occur.